started uh, is the microbiology. He said we are able to classify bacteria according to gram staining, to gram positive um, cocaine and gram positive for bacilli. Isn't it? Then we went further on and also classified gram positive bacilli to three different types. He said we have the spore forming ones and the non spore forming ones. Isn't it? The spore forming ones are the bacillus and the prostrator. And the non spore forming ones are the growing bacterium species. Or there are different species involved. So growing bacterium and then the mysterium and cytogen. And then those that are also involved. So basically, today we are going to be talking closely uh, at uh, this thing, bacillus species. That's what I'll be giving you the details of. Shall we? Then we are going to be bacillus anthracis and bacillus cereus. So if you look at bacillus and this thing, anthrax like this, that is the name of the bacteria itself. So morphologically, if you look at it under a microscope, it is usually gram positive bacilli. Generally, it is very large and sometimes very long. So gram positive large bacilli are in one, clusters. Or the, no, arranged in one, in, in, in stretch, in, in chains. You understand? Simply means it is large and you know, in that order. It is, it is in chains. There are also aerobic bacteria. If you look at many, uh, many uh, just in reference books, you tell they are aerobic bacteria. But uh, if you go more like, detailed into it, there are different species of bacillus that are also anaerobic. An example is bacillus subtilis. Uh, usually, if you look at the electron transport chain, we usually use oxygen as a last electron acceptor. But if you look at bacillus subtilis, it uses nitrate instead of oxygen as, an, uh, as a last electron acceptor. As a result of that, you classify it as anaerobic what, bacteria. So, some people will tell you they are for quantitative anaerobes, but generally, we like to refer to them as uh, just the aerobic bacteria. The reason being that those species of bacillus that are pathogenic to us is what we are interested in, not the others. That is why we generally classify it as aerobic bacteria. They are also spore forming bacteria in that um, you know, these spores that they form, they are able to withstand very high temperatures. They are also able to withstand uh, disinfectants. And more to the point also, what happens here is that um, they can remain very dormant for like decades. I mean like 10 years, 20 years, they can still be in the soil, but they are viable. And when they enter into you, they can, they can trigger a reaction. You see what I'm saying? So generally, bacillus anthracis, or bacillus in general, they are aerobic bacteria, they are spore forming bacteria, they are also ubiquitous. Meaning they can be found almost anywhere. You can find them in the air, you can find them in the soil, you can find them on food, you can find them like anywhere at all you can see it. That is what you mean by what we keep us. So basically that is the general this thing for you know passages as in general. So we are not going to be taking a close look at passages what anthracis. Now one thing that makes um, a passivus anthracis very specific is that it, it, it has this you know protein cover around it. You know all bacteria usually have capsules made up of polysaccharide. But if you look at bacillus anthracis, it has a specific type of protein around its capsule. Uh, it is called the poly, the, the poly D glutamic acid. That is what makes it very, very unique. And it is, it is a virulence factor because it prevents the bacteria from being phagocytosed by macrophages. You get that? And if you look at bacillus anthracis, as we said, they are spore forming. Now when they produce these spores, usually the spores are carried by animals and not human beings. Because no human to human uh, this thing, uh, this thing, transmission has been recorded since the discovery of bacillus anthracis. It is only animal to animal uh, transmission. So humans cannot get, I cannot get uh, this thing, the virus, I cannot get the bacterial infection from a friend, like maybe you know, just a human being, like Jamal or whatever thing. I can only get it through animals. So people who pet animals, or people who work in factories that use animal, uh, animal products. So what is the pathogenesis of the disease? That is bacillus anthracis. We said they are spore forming. So usually we can get a disease through animals. So when we inhale in the spores, the spores are certain locations in our body they tend to germinate in. They can move into the lungs, they can move into the germ and the gastrointestinal tract. They can also move into your skin. And depending on where the infection is being caused, then we have the name of it. So if it's on the skin, we say it's a cutaneous anthrax. If it is the gastrointestinal tract, then we say what? It's an intestinal anthrax. And if it's inside the lung, then we say it's a what? It's a pulmonary anthrax. But if you take a close look at it, people tend to confuse between pulmonary anthrax and then pneumonia. But there's a difference in it. But if you look at pulmonary anthrax, it's usually you know, involved in what? A patient that work in a wool sorter's factory. You know a wool? Do you know what a wool is? You know, we have cotton wool. You know, we get it from animals. So people that usually work in these places and factories like that, they are capable of getting these diseases. That is what the pulmonary of anthrax. And also the cutaneous what anthrax. Um, sometimes the spores also can what can move into your what, into your skins. But they move into an what an open you know an open what uh, this thing enclosure on your skin. What they do is that they can cause a localized necrosis. That is, they can kill the cells around that place. They begin to germinate and then they produce potent exotoxins. Now these toxins 
and then you see the thirteen they produce is what makes it what electrotic. And you can see it what it, it presents with a what with a black sign. So usually you see those type of patients they present with a what with a very dark skin and then a rim of what of edema. We call it the malignant booster. Uh, if you look at this malignant booster, it, it calls for a medical emergency because if it is not quickly treated, it can move into the lymphatic systems. They begin to multiply, germinate them, and then they can invade into the bloodstream. And this can eventually lead to death. So looking at the cutaneous or anthracis, that is one of the most common ways by which you know, we can get the antra disease. The most rarest way we can get the antra disease is through the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and the reason why we are saying it is very rare is that you know, uh, this one usually tends to affect you know, people, I mean primitive communities, communities that usually eat animals that are dying from the antra disease. So basically the, the, the animal is having the spores in it, isn't it? So when we take it in, we are in a primitive community and we don't have much of them like that. So that is why we say this one. It is, it is the rarest one. And in fact, it is the most crucial one. It is rare and it is the most what, crucial one. And what, it, what happens here is that when the bacteria enter into your, uh, the, the, the endospores, when they enter into your gastric intestinal tract, they begin to secrete it exotoxins. I mean, potent exotoxins. And they can cause symptoms of, of vomiting like diarrhea. Not just any diarrhea, but a bloody diarrhea. We can get gastroenteritis from that. Now, you may be asking what, what actually is making this exotoxin very, very pathogenic like that. The reason being that, you know, as the bacteria are being introduced into our system, be it the DIT or the what, or the skin, or maybe be it inside the what, the lungs. If, if you remember your molecular biology very well, you know that we move from what, from DNA replication to, uh, from DNA replication to transcription. We get RNA there, from RNA we get proteins. And if you look at bacteria, it's almost, most of the bacteria, they are resistant to antibiotics because they possess a certain type of chromosome. A certain type of uh, DNA we call the extra chromosome, that is the plasmid. And this plasmid you see in here, they usually encode for certain genes. And the genes are responsible for secreting of all, for the production of, of certain proteins. It is this protein that provides them or the protection against what? Against these um, antibiotics and stuff like that. So, bacillus anthracis is usually, they have these um, genes we call the PXO1 and then PXO2. If you require to remember, I began by saying that they have a, what, a special protein, a protein called the polyglutamic acid. Now the gene that codes for the polyglutamic uh, acid is called the PXO2. That is what uh, that is the gene. So it is going to replicate into, into an MRI. That's a messenger RNA. Then later on, it's going to be translated into a protein, and that is what forms the what the code. Now the exotoxins also that are being produced. There are three of the exotoxins that are being produced. We have the lethal factor, the edema factor, and then the what uh, the 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 anti demon factors. These are the three what toxins that are being produced. When these toxins are being produced individually, they do not have effect on our system. But when they are combined, that is when they cause the, the systemic what, effects of passivus or anthracis. So this gets a general vision of what the pathogenesis and there are a whole lot of things involved in the bacterium, a lot of things. Note that. And we are also going to look at the, what, the diagnosis of this disease. So when your patient comes to the hospital or maybe is suffering from passivus anthracis, what is the first thing you are supposed to do? You are supposed to want to collect the specimen depending on the, what, on the site of the infection. So if it is suffering from, from a, just a cutaneous anthrax, then you need a swab from the skin. The same way when you're suffering from a land infection, you need the scooter. When you're suffering from a gastrointestinal disease, you maybe you need a feces or you know, something of that sort. So after taking this specimen according to the site of the collection, then we make a, a microscopic examination to see whether this sputum it contains blood or not, or to see any differences. Maybe is it, is it different from the normal thing we already knew or not. But there's a note to be taken here because bacillus anthracis is very pathogenic. You see that, so you know it's very good that you know you don't you don't you don't give out your precautions like wearing of clothes and wearing boots and stuff like that. If you look at it, the US like this in the year 2001, it was used as a bioterrorism. I mean, it's a biological weapon because it is a very pathogenic one, bacteria. Uh, according to gram staining, also when you when you make a gram staining morphologically under the microscope, you are going to see it as gram positive large bacilli arranged in clusters, like I said earlier on. And then we also have a type of reaction we call the Macrinis reaction. It's in a, uh, it's in a polyprometallic reaction. So what we do with this is that it helps us to go to detect the capsule because bacillus anthracis are capsulated. So after you make this one, um, this particular staining technique, what you do is that the bacillus itself, that is the bacteria, they appear to be blue in color. And then the capsule that is surrounding it appears to be what, to be pink, and sometimes they appear to be red. They are also sporulated, like we said earlier on. The spores are usually oval and then they are central. And we can do the spore staining. We do the spore staining in our previous elements. So I don't have to repeat that again. And this is just some of the lab diagnosis we can do. We can also, you know, grow them on the culture media. You see that culture media is like the blood agar. So on the blood agar, when you look at the culture media, sometimes you add penicillin to it to check the resistance or the sensitivity of the bacteria to that particular penicillin. 
So that's which actors is specifically like this. It's what is sensitive to what to penicillin. Then it is what is gamma hemolytic, which means there is neither alpha or beta hemolysis observed after it was being grown in the blood in that. And usually the media, you look at the bacteria in the media, they, they usually are uh, this thing. They are green, sometimes they can be white. And they have this you know, structure we call the Medusa head structure. Uh, they are Medusa head like, you see that. And then they have these wavy ends. If you look at the bacteria like this, the ends are what are wavy. And then they become also sticky. They cannot you know, easily remove them out of the water, out of the media. That is what we call the, the Medusa head. And then biochemically also we can do the what the lecithinase one test. Now when we talk about lecithinase, you can see from the name itself, the enzyme is what is AS, which is an, it's an enzyme. So lecithinase is an enzyme that is produced by most of what of bacteria. So we basically perform this test to identify bacteria that are capable of producing the, what the lecithinase enzyme. So when you produce this lecithinase, okay. So when they produce this lecithinase enzyme, we like to grow them on a media we call an, an egg media. Because in, a, in an egg, we have what we refer to as a lecithin. So when they produce the lecithinase enzyme, it breaks down the lecithin, which is found inside the egg, into diglyceride. And you know that diglyceride is a type of it's a type of fat, so it is still solid. So in the media, you are going to say, because you know the way we do DNA test, now we now do DNA media, then we just make a strip in the middle. The same way for the lecithinase test, you are going to take an egg medium, then you make a strip in the middle, like a DNA test. Later on, if the enzyme is lecithinase positive, it is going to produce the lecithinase enzyme, and it is going to break down lecithin, which is found inside the media. And how do you observe it? You see, the lecithin, when, when it's broken down, it is converted into, into diglyceride. And this diglyceride is seen as an opaque, hollow area around the world, the bacteria. And that is how we know whether this is lecithinase positive or lecithinase negative. So, with respect to bacillus anthracis, the amount of lecithinase it produces is very, very weak, not strong, as that of bacillus cirrus. And then we can also perform a biochemical test like a gelatin hydrolysis work or gelatin manufacturing work test. And basically, the principle behind the test is that you know, some bacteria are able to produce the gelatinous enzyme. This enzyme tends to break down the gelatin into polypeptides. And we know polypeptide is a chain of, what, of several uh, amino acids, right? The polypeptides will further be broken down into amino acids, which is used by the bacteria for its metabolic work, uh, processes. You see that? So they are able to produce the gelatin and it's breaking down all these things. Later on, we incubate this gelatin media. After some time, like at 10 70 degrees Celsius, after some time they remove it and put it into a refrigerator at a temperature of like 4 degrees Celsius. But that's a, a place very cold. You see that? If it still remains liquid, then it is what? Positive for gelatin. If it is solidified, then it is what? It's negative for gelatin. Then we can also perform a what? A phage reaction, where we react it with certain types of, of immunoglobulins. And if you look at possible what anthracis, they usually are, they are sensitive to this what? To this phage. So when you react them with the phage reaction, you can see you know, a certain type of clearance around the, 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 the colonies. And you can also perform tests like, um, let me see, like a catalyst test also. You know, they are also catalyst one and positive. And even if you come to serological tests, you can use enzyme and immuno, immunosorbate acid. That is an immunological test, like we did in the last time. I think that's basically all about bacillus anthracis. And then there's nothing much to talk about when it comes to bacillus cereals. You can see from the name itself, it's more or less like it's found in cereals, like rice. You know, we can find them in millet and other food substances like milk. And I mean, many of the food you can think of. That is where we find the bacillus cereals. So these bacillus cereals usually their spores can be deposited on this food product. And when we eat them, if they are deposited on the food product, it means that the food is what is poison. It's contaminated. And when we eat them, we can get what food poisoning. You see that? And if you look at these bacillus cereals, they also produce two types of what exotoxins. We have the heat liver toxin and the heat stable toxin. Now the heat stable toxin, what it does is that it, 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 it causes a limited form of diarrhea. You run diarrhea, but it is intermittent. It is not continuous. That is what you mean by what? Uh, there is a limited uh, and intermittent for diarrhea. It is because of the heat stable toxins. And we have heat labor toxins. For these toxins, they cause continuous diarrhea. You be, be having vomiting, you have nausea, you have cramps, and so on and so forth. In some books, they refer to it as emetic form. And some also refer to it as, what, as a diarrhea form. But looking at the, uh, this trail, the, the diagnosis between the bacillus anthracis and the bacillus cereals, they are almost closely related. There's a little difference. For the gelatin hydrolysis or liquefaction test for um, bacillus cereals, it, it tends to be positive and it is rapid because immediately you need, sometimes you don't even waste time to incubate or even uh, refrigerate it, but you, can, you see the beta turning into, into a liquid form. So in that case, it, it, is, it, is, it is rapidly positive for gelatin or liquefaction test. Uh, and then phage, uh, lysis also, I think it's negative for phase, for phase lysis. It 
they are also grown on a large media. Yes, as Basilus and Francis can also grow, and also the culture of the black media. The only difference between them is that the Basilus and Francis is sensitive to penicillin, and that of the Basilus series is what is resistant to penicillin. And I think basically that is all you have to know about this. And then we have a special media for Basilus series, which is MYP. Yeah, you have a question. The what? Hemolysis for what? Okay, okay. For this thing, the bacillus um, and uh, the antrix, I said it was sensitive to penicillin. Then the hemolysis here is a gamma hemolysis, which we should neither see an alpha or a beta hemolysis. The, 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 the media remains as it is. There is no breakdown of the red blood cells. And if you look at the bacillus what serious, usually we have a beta hemolysis, which means there is a clearing around the wall, the zones, inside the wall, the bacteria. Any other question? No, no, no.